Welcome to the speaker series for the Snohomish County Transportation Coalition. I'm Brock Howell, Executive Director of SnowTrack. Today, SnowTrack is excited to host Nathan Voss. We thank Transportation Choices Coalition serving as a co-host of today's forum. As a, this real quick here, uh, as a mobility management coalition, SnowTrack advocates for connecting people and communities in Snohomish County and beyond with safe, equitable, and accessible transportation by bringing together transportation and human service providers uh, to identify mobility gaps and opportunities. SnowTrack focuses especially on specific priority populations, people with disabilities, older adults, youth, low-income individuals, as well as people of color, immigrants and refugees, veterans, rural communities, and tribal nations. June is Ride Transit Month, organized by Transportation Choices Coalition. Ride Transit Month is a way to celebrate the incredible role that transit plays in our communities. With our speaker series, we hope to inspire Snohomish County leaders and advocates with thought-provoking speakers. And so I cannot be more pleased to have Nathan Voss here with us today. Nathan is an artist, filmmaker, photographer, and King County Metro bus driver. As a driver, he's been called a therapist, anthropologist, and lion tamer. In his book, The Lions That Make Us, Stories from Nathan's Bus, Nathan lyrically connects people of all backgrounds across Seattle. Nathan's empathic approach towards life and bus driving and manner in which he lifts up and builds community through his bus driving is an inspiration. We'll have Q&A at the end, so be sure to think of your questions throughout the presentation. I'm gonna launch a, a quick survey so Nathan knows who's here. So if you can take a moment um, to complete the survey, it's just three questions. Real basic. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna close the poll now. So we have, I don't know, counting a couple of people who didn't take the poll, uh, about 10 people from Snohomish County here, uh, about a third of us, uh, a fair number from King Pierce or Kitsap County, and even a few from outside of Washington State. So thank you all for being here today. Um, we, you can see also a fair number of work in Snohomish County or nearby counties, uh, and that most people focus on transportation issues, but there are some folks within the human services and other uh, areas as well as their focus. Thank you for being here. Um, Nathan, it's great to have you here, and I'm going to just let you take it away now. Brock, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, it's a treat to be here with you guys. Uh, and uh, thanks especially to Brock and the Coalition at Large for reaching out to me directly um, to get to be a part of this. It's an honor to get to, get to chat with you guys. Um, uh, I really like what you just said at the beginning, Brock, about priority populations and, and uh, that, that being the focus. I've been driving best for 17 years, but I can distinctly remember uh, one of the things my trainer said very early on and that was, he, he reminded us that you are here specifically as an operator to pick up um, those who are transit dependent, um, disabled, young students, the old, the elderly, the, the, those who face challenges, those who are socioeconomically challenged, um, those who are living on the street, you should be happy when you see those individuals waiting at the bus stop that you're pulling up to, because those are your primary uh, uh, group of folks that you're serving. This is not about um, uh, serving only choice commuters. This is about those priority populations. And I'm really happy to hear that um, that's a priority for you guys too. Uh, just getting started. Um, thanks, th um, thanks so much for being here. I don't know how much you do public speaking or, um, 
our educators, but uh, it is a challenge to speak when I cannot see the audience's uh, faces. So I'm, I'm taking a leap of faith in terms of uh, whether or not this is going over. Can you hear me? Um, if you wish to un unmute your camera, as I can see a lot of you are doing, uh, that's, that's helpful for me. Um, but uh, I thought I would get started by saying that when we talk about trans tr transportation and urban planning, we're often looking, especially from an administrative standpoint, at the holistic view, um, and thinking about data, crunching numbers, uh, analyzing ridership patterns, and so on. And uh, it's useful for us to remember that uh, at the end of the day, this is about people. Um, this is about individual human lives and how we can help those lives and improve their uh, quality of living. And uh, that's why I write the stories. Um, I thought I would start off um, just with a little intro in terms of structure here, in terms of where I'm coming from and where this book of mine is coming from. Then I'll uh, read you guys a story. Then I'll give you a little bit of background uh, on how the blog and the book got started, what it's like to have uh, driven during COVID and so on. Uh, I'm also working on a second book and uh, that's not available to the public yet, but I wanted to read you a story from that um, because you guys took time out of your day to be here. I really appreciate it. I um, wanted to give you something special and uh, do, do keep in mind um, uh, questions or comments for Q&A later. I've got some questions for you guys, especially about transit up in Snohomish County because I'm not as familiar with it as I am down here in the Seattle area. Um, so as, as Brock mentioned, my day job is in the arts. I'm an author, filmmaker, um, fine art photographer, and the night job is where things get exciting. That's where I'm driving the city bus, uh, primarily in central and south Seattle on the number seven uh, and others. Um, something that has been illuminated to me from driving buses all these years and interacting with the folks is, is that I get the impression that we choose our beliefs. We, we, we decide what we believe about humanity at large, and we tend to only see what we're looking for. Whatever perspective you have on humanity is what you're going to see when you go out there on the routes. And you got to be careful with that because that's a slippery slope. You can, you can start to get to thinking some pretty awful things about uh, uh, people, especially these days. Uh, some bus driver colleagues and myself call that the fall. It's where you start to slip and um, cynicism takes over. I try to look for the positive um, when I'm out there. Uh, this, this book of mine that Brock mentioned, um, uh, it's mostly unexpectedly positive interactions, true stories that have, have, have happened on my route, or heavy and challenging subject matter that's presented in something other than a miserableist lens. Uh, I do not think having a positive outlook is easy. I think it is difficult, especially now, but I find it useful. I think it's constructive and worth expending the effort to try to sustain it. I urge you guys to check out my book, um, not just because my publisher wants me to sell uh, copies, but because the citywide conversation that we all have in Seattle now is no longer about the weather or sports, uh, but about the state of the streets. Um, who's out there? Do we feel safe, etc. cetera? Um, and this, this book is my contribution to that dialogue. Um, primarily the idea of that if you're looking for goodness, um, you're going to find it. Um, and I thought I would begin by reading you a short story. Um, uh, these are all true stories, of course. Uh, I, don't, I don't make anything up. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah, let's uh, just kick back and enjoy this. This is um, the middle of the night and we're in the U District. She looked apprehensive. I probably did too. The clock had just struck midnight and angry voices boomed in our periphery. She was out there waiting for the bus in a white and yellow summer dress, breezy, perhaps wishing there was someone around, anybody besides this angry yelling man approaching. I was inside my darkened bus, waking up disoriented from a short nap. My shift was almost done and it had, it had been a breeze, but it's never over till it's over. 
Bus drivers sometimes ride my bus to get a feel for the nighttime Route 7, different ways of handling it. Certain passenger friends call a ride on my 7 bus therapy, while some drivers have dubbed it the Nathan Voss refresher course. I, I doubt it qualifies for those lofty uh, uh, monikers. Um, I prefer to call it my office hours. But I did have an evening where three operators, unbeknownst to each other, all came out to ride the last half of my shift. I was telling them that it's never over until it's completely over, till you've parked the bus on the lane inside the yard. You could be a hundred feet away from home base and it could still all fall apart. As it happened, we were about a hundred feet away from home base, these drivers and I, wrapping up the shift when, wouldn't you know it, a woman came running out of the bushes with blood on her hands and wrist and waist, waving her arms and asking us for assistance with her boyfriend who had been stabbing her. It's never over till it's over. We called for help and she got the assistance she needed. I try not to offer relationship advice to random strangers, but given the circumstances, I said, um, you might think about dumping this guy. She said, oh God, yes. It was with these thoughts that I stood and stretched out of my nap. There were some real angry voices out there. I sighed. It did not matter how carefree the day had been. In its last minutes, you might still have to step up, summon your better angels, and steer the moment as best you can. I opened the door and turned on the interior lights. Summer dress, the woman with the summer dress, and I made nervous eye contact, neither of us quite sure what was transpiring. She was still standing out there. I was standing by the fare box as a belligerent voice came closer and closer. Hi, I said to her with kind eyes. Any friendly stranger is a friend, not a stranger in an intense situation. Hey, she replied. Cute blue eyes, short with headphones she knew not to be listening to right now. Don't nobody talk to me that way, said a tall man in dark clothes and a beanie, a bass inflected gravel rasp to his throaty din. It sounded vaguely familiar. Where have I heard that voice before? Ah, yes, I put it together right before I saw his face. Marcus loomed out of the shadows, walking down from the bus behind me. Boy, does it ever pay off to know a man's name. You never know when you'll see someone again or how. The genial history he and I have paid off in spades now. The present instantly diffused and the young woman's eyes lit up with surprise, comfort, and relaxation as I said in a friendly tone, just a tad quieter than normal. Hey, Marcus, you don't sound too happy. He exhaled, calming down. No, man, this guy trying to tell me to take my shit and get off the bus. And I said, you can always hang out on my bus. And he says, I know, but this guy's just, and I, and I cut in and say, I'm sorry to hear it, man. You know, you can always hang in here. The young lady was searching for her purse for change to pay the fare. She looked up at him saying, oh, you go ahead. I think Marcus realized then that he was scaring people. He looked at her now over the rims of his wireframe glasses, not lasciviously, but how a father looks at girls his daughter's age with caring. I love watching people think. He deflated further back to his normal self and said, oh no, I always let ladies go first. He smiled and she returned the same, feeling the tension slack loose. I said, so he was giving you some attitude? Marcus didn't even need to vent. I'm okay, he said warily. It's just too hot for all that. And I say, yeah, we gotta keep it low key. Tone of voice, choice of words, I've asked hundreds of people, including Marcus himself, to step off the bus at various ends of the line. I've never told them to though, and I've definitely never used the words he quoted the other brand new driver as saying. If I told all those people to take their shit on and get off my bus, I don't think I would even be alive. Instead, I have the respect of friends in more corners of society than I ever could have imagined, corners I never knew existed. Seeing the young woman realize she could relax, that everything was okay, that for some reason this driver knew this guy by name and they could talk things down. I didn't know that would be the highlight of my night. It's never over till it's over. Thank you for listening to that. Um, thank you. So when we have a positive interaction with a stranger, 
whether it's on the sidewalk corner, you're talking about sports or you're um, in the coffee shop line, uh, chat chatting with the barista or the person behind you. Moments when you have a positive interaction with someone you don't know causes a neurochemical reaction in our brain where we feel a sense of belonging to humanity at large, to the totality of society. It feels very good. That is a different sensation than the good feeling we get when we have a positive interaction with someone we know, such as our friends or family. It is not possible to get that sensation of feeling a sense of belonging to humanity at large when you're talking to your friends. Your friends and family are not humanity at large or, or the totality of society. Um, to get that sort of buzz, that, that uh, sensation of belonging to something big, uh, that happens when you have a good moment with a stranger. Um, and for that reason, it's worthwhile to, to interact with these other people. And it's something I try to engender so that other people can have those moments on my bus. I say hi to every single person who gets on. I do the um, street announcements myself instead of letting the automatic voice do it. I yell out thank you and so on. And I try to establish a communal atmosphere. Um, I did not do that when I started though, because I didn't know about any of this stuff. I was very shy. I was a new operator. I was out of my element. Bus driving is pretty overwhelming when you're first beginning. And uh, my training and education had nothing to do with this. Uh, I, I studied in the, in, you know, I went to art school. I don't know how to talk to people. Um, and I remember the first route they gave me, which went past a methadone rehab clinic in Soto off of Airport Way. And I have the distinct memory early in my career of pulling up to that bus stop. There's a whole big crowd of people, 30 or 40 people there. And they were of a living condition and socioeconomic background that I didn't have a lot of familiarity interacting with. And I remember thinking, I don't know what to do here. I have, I have been given no template for how to, how to talk to these folks. Um, what should I do? As I opened the doors, I realized what I'm gonna try, I don't know if this is gonna work, but I'm gonna try to talk to all these people as if we're already friends, as if we're already sort of know each other and uh, are starting off as equals. So that's what I did. To each person getting on, I said, hey, how are you? Good morning, come on in. That group of folks turned out to be the friendliest and most exciting and wonderful group of folks. I picked up on that entire route. They were so receptive to respect and acknowledgement. Um, and uh, I quickly began to realize that the currency of the street uh, is respect. That's the thing that, that makes the world go round out there. And that's how you establish relationships. Um, and some of these moments were so rewarding to me that I began writing them down. I began starting, um, this was the beginning of my blog where I was writing down these moments, trying to capture them as accurately as possible because there were so many that I realized I'm not gonna remember these. And uh, I started the blog just as a sort of like show to my friends, here's what I'm doing when I'm working, you know? I did not expect it to take off and become a big thing, uh, but it did and it became, popular enough that it transitioned into a book. I'm currently working on a second book. Um, this first book, The Lines That Make Us, it's a textbook at Seattle University. I go and talk to the students there. Um, they're, they're often very energized by it because we're discussing environments that they themselves have been in. Um, it was up for the Washington State Book Awards, which tends not to happen for uh, first-time authors. Um, and Lately, I've been getting more comments and feedback about it on, on the road, when, um, when, um, when I'm out doing um, art events and so on. Uh, even though the book came out five years ago, I think that's because the subject matter has become more topical. Um, as we move through COVID and um, as these social justice movements have, have come to light and illuminated our perspective in various ways, um, the book, I think, has gained relevance, um, not to toot my own horn, but just to sort of lend a sense of appreciation and enthusiasm for where we're headed as, as uh, transit agencies. Um, 
And uh, I like to think that it's a book that in, engages with those issues without being driven by them. Um, it's not a political book. It's, it's I think these, these issues transcend um, partisan perspectives. Um, so that's kind of where I'm coming from with uh, the book and the blog. Uh, um, I imagine some of you are gonna ask of what it was like to drive the bus through COVID because that's something that always comes up. Um, it was both the best and the worst time to be operating transit. It was the best time because there was no traffic. It was fantastic. You could get from you know here to here in an ungodly amount of uh, short amount of time and it was absolutely beautiful. There were very few people on the bus. I would drive routes in North Seattle where I didn't have a single passenger uh, for hours. However, uh, it was also the worst time to drive transit because the security incidents absolutely skyrocketed. Um, everyone, no matter where they were, was now a few rungs down on the ladder of where they're trying to, of what they're trying to achieve with their life and where they want to be. And um, people are not at their best when they're forced into those situations. Um, just a lot of uh, a lot of really difficult behavior, challenging situations, and uh, Metro not being in a position where it had the luxury of extra finance and resources to uh, accommodate training um, or guidance for for how to navigate these situations. Um, and I imagine the situation may have been similar up in Snow County. Uh, so, yeah. I, I would say that driving during COVID was just okay. Um, and I am, I guess I should let you guys decide. I always enjoy when, when functions like this work better more as a discussion than, a, uh, than me just blabbing on. I know what I'm gonna say. I wanna know what you guys are gonna say and what you're thinking. Um, I'd love to hear some, some thoughts and questions from you guys. While you guys are coming up with that, I'm going to respond to one that's already here in the chat um, uh, from Thomas. Thank you. I have, uh, and uh, Th Thomas says, I have enough seniority to do many other times or routes. How, how do I decide what to pick? Great question. I'm the very first operator to pick the Route 7 at nighttime because nobody does that if they don't have to. Uh, I think it's a whole lot of fun though. Why wouldn't I wanna be out there? Um, establishing relationships with people on the street is very rewarding and something I think is important to uh, instill into operators. I don't know how many of you guys supervise operators or know people who do, but it's constructive to pass on to them that the people that they're having interactions with, uh, they're gonna see those people again, um, maybe in an hour, maybe in a month, Maybe that person has five brothers. Maybe that, you know, you have to, um, you have to remember that uh, these folks aren't going anywhere. They're like the family member that you don't like at your holiday gatherings that you just have to learn how to get along with because they're always going to be present. And I've discovered that leaning into the customer service angle of the job accomplishes more in terms of sort of kill them with kindness, the soft sell, whatever phrase we want to use. You can get so much done um, by, by suggesting things in terms of how you phrase, if you're trying to get them to, if, if, if you're trying to get passengers to follow rules, um, or by just indicating that you acknowledge them. People like fe feeling heard and uh, those of you who are managers or involved in leadership already know that, but operators may not be getting that sort of training because we don't conceive of bus drivers as, as leaders or functioning in any, any, any sort of managerial capacity. However, those skills are useful when they're uh, interacting with passengers. Um, I picked the seven at nighttime and final answer to Thomas because uh, it's the most rewarding. I don't pick it because it's cooler or more dangerous or something like that. I just, I feel more fulfilled, you know? I feel like I'm doing more. Uh, these, these passengers are, they're transit dependent. They remember me. Um, and it's a lot more fun to talk to these folks because they're more talkative. Um, they're not all looking at their phone the whole time. There are studies that suggest that, um, in neighborhoods or areas that are 
less safe by any measure of metrics, uh, the sense of community is stronger in those areas because people have to rely on each other for safety uh, and, uh, and uh, to get along. And driving in areas like that is enormously rewarding and I try to embrace that. Uh, it's more work, it's more involved, but doesn't it kind of feel good to like any kind of sports or art or whatever it is uh, to get to a place where you're doing it well? Um, it's, it's very satisfying, it makes me feel good. So thank you, Thomas, for that question. Um, what caused the switch to become more outgoing to passengers? Thank you, Atiyah, that's a great question. Um, prior to being a bus driver, I worked at Capitol Records in Hollywood and I was the mailroom clerk. My job was to get signatures for packages, for uh, deliveries at all levels of the tower. And I had to, um, you know, knock on people's doors and have small interactions with uh, all levels of management there. And that kind of forced me out of my shell and uh, uh, made me have to learn how to make small talk, how to read people. Um, prior to working in Capitol Records, I worked at a library for six years here in King County. And libraries are similar to buses in that they're totally public, totally egalitarian spaces that anyone can enter. And uh, yeah, if, you, if you're trying to like groom a, 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 an operator who feels comfortable at their job, you might make them work um, as a mailroom clerk and as a library page, because um, uh, that helps. I also discovered that being more welcoming to passengers makes my job easier in addition to improving the passengers' days. Um, the more you put in, the more you get out type of deal. Uh, I hope I'm not oversimplifying that. Um, Amy Biggs asks, have you had the ability to help some of the new KC operators by having your stories incorporated? Yes, yes, training has been enormously supportive. They ask me to come down and talk to their full-time classes, speaking with new operators who are going into night driving for the first time. Um, the book and the blog are heavily rotated as training materials, um, which was not their original intent, but I love that they're being re re repurposed for that because uh, you know we are human beings and stories are one of the ways in which we remember information the best. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm thankful for that. I, I, I like getting to talk with new operators and help them out. And I honestly wish I got the chance to do that more often. All of our refresher training or um, similar materials have been tabled because of COVID, since COVID, um, which I don't think is the best. Um, interesting comment by uh, Amy Biggs. Instead of asking the drivers, how is your route going? We ask, how are your riders? That's very fascinating. I love the, that that implies care um, in terms of considering the needs of the passengers. Oh, I wish we did that here in King County. Please come work for us. Um, okay. Uh, Stacy says, we receive a lot of feedback from community members on driver training and sensitivity training. Yes, I would love if we had that. Um, did you attend a great training or was coached to have this mindset? Um, I was driving to 70 North on Third Avenue, crossing Stewart Street, and there was a guy sitting in the front chat seat. I call it the chat seat, the chair that's closest to the operator. And I could tell that he was unstable. And he was telling me that um, the vice president is coming to town and that as a result, the price of, of, of gremlins, if you're hunting for gremlins, the, the arrival of the vice president is gonna increase the head price of every, of, of every gremlin that you kill. And I decided to respond to him as if what he was saying made total sense. Um, and just said, oh yeah, wow, how much is it gonna cost? How, how much money do you get? What's the bounty price for gremlins uh, when the president is in town, et cetera. And that was a method that turned out to be very useful um, as a survival mechanism. 
um, leaning into interacting with folks, meeting them at their level. When someone gets on the bus, you've got a quarter of a second to decide which is better to interact with this person or not engage with this person. 90 times out of 100, 99 times out of 100, it's better for, I think, to engage. There is that one time out of 100, though, it's better not to say anything. And you've got such a small amount of time to decide. You've really got to go off of instinct. And the longer one does this job, the sort of better you get at honing that muscle where the hairs on the back of your neck go up and you know what you need to do or not do. Um, so in answer to that question, it's kind of been flying by the seat of my pants coming up with ways of surviving out here. We do not have classes that um, stress the value of emphasizing this as a community customer service job as a way of doing better at the job, resulting in better experiences for passengers, but also ourselves. Um, I think the best bus drivers are ones who also ride buses. Most of the drivers at uh, KC Metro right now don't fit that description. Um, I feel like I'm one of the few who actually rides transit. And I think it uh, just automatically makes you better. Uh, Stacy asks, did you come to the role already with this attitude? In some ways, yes, because when you ride the bus, you know how great it is when the driver is friendly, you know how annoying it is when the driver leaves you or when they stomp on the brakes, et cetera. And you, and you develop an understanding of what it's like from the other side. Um, that's my long-winded answer. Uh, thank you, Stacy, for asking that. Um, how did I decide to become a, a bus driver? When do I sleep? Great question. Um, so <laughs> I don't do true night work, which, which I consider, you know, going all through graveyard type of deal. I don't do that because I can't. My body just wants to go, but it stops working after 1 a.m. I tend to work about four to midnight. And then uh, from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. is when I'm working on art. Um, ben Franklin's original idea of, of the eight hour workday, which would then give you eight hours of sleep followed by eight hours of spare time. Uh, we all know it doesn't work like that and that your spare time gets almost entirely used uh, preparing for work and coming home from work. For me, bumping the workday deeper into the evening puts those remaining eight, eight hours, as it were, as one big chunk in the morning um, so I can get up and do my thing and take care of, of stuff before I go to work and then work in the evenings. I decided to become a bus driver because I always thought it would be a really fun thing to do. Um, I used to be embarrassed to share this because I know it's a minority opinion, but uh, I just think buses are awesome. And I grew up riding them and I, and I thought, it's amazing that all this infrastructure is here for anyone to use. Wild, crazy. They've put up all that trolley wire, they've got rail track laid down and all these routes that run all the time, whether or not you need them. I just think that's amazing. And there was something about that that was, um, that was comforting, that felt like an embrace, you know, on the part of the city. And, uh, that made me excited. In terms of the overlap between working in the arts and working in transit, the reason both of them are interesting to me is they share the overlap of uh, an intense fascination with human nature. The architect John Young said that the best job for an artist uh, is a bus driver. Um, we don't know why he said that, but I imagine it's because it was in reference to the amount of inspiration. Um, it gets you out of your self-absorbed artist head and reminds you of all the other life that's going on. Um, when I have um, gone through very difficult times when I've got a family member in the hospital or something, uh, and I would take a lot of days off to try to attend to these very urgent needs, I would still come into work um, one or two days out of the week because I found it useful as therapy to be reminded of, look, all this other life is continuing to go on and I can continue to participate in it. Um, thank you for asking those, uh, those questions, Peg. Um, Thomas, does your bus have a driver barrier? Let's talk about this. Um, right before this 
talk, I was having a conversation with some administrative staff at uh, King County about this very issue. I've noticed that at CT at least, uh, those buses do not have barriers. That excites me. Um, unfortunately, met, met, Metro buses do have what administration calls a partition, what drivers call a shield, and what for the purposes of this discussion we can call a barrier. Um, in some ways, it has been useful. The people behave differently now on the street. Um, there, is, there are more security incidents. There is higher incidence of violence. And having a barrier seems to be something that keeps up with that shift in behavior. Uh, do I feel safer? Yes, I do. Um, there used to be a guy an older gentleman who did not speak English who would get on the bus and grab the steering wheel because he thought it was funny, you know, sort of like fun grandpa, you know, he's going to reach over and honk the horn and then grab the steering wheel a little bit. I did not find that funny. It was terrifying. Uh, he doesn't do that anymore because there's a shield in the way. There used to be a woman who I believe was living on the street who uh, would as she got off the bus, she would press the button, she'd reach over to my driver area and press the button to call the police. Uh, she did not know that that was the button to call the police, I don't think, but uh, she loved doing that. And then I had to explain to my supervisor uh, what had just happened, and they were never thrilled to hear about that. Um, there's another fellow, Marcel, who likes to ride the bus, and we like to have conversations. Before the barrier was installed, I had to sort of sit there as Marcel's phlegm and saliva uh, flew all over me as he talks because he talks with a lot of enthusiasm. Now I can watch with pleasure as his phlegm and saliva land on the shield and then come nowhere closer to me. It's wonderful. However, I'm talking about all of these things as if they happen regularly. They do not. These are extremely rare. Most of the time, it would be better if the barrier was not there. This is a customer service job. My strongest tool or weapon for navigating challenging situations is customer service. The barrier prevents me from using that tool as well as I might because they have difficulty hearing me. The barrier being made of clear plastic creates a lot of glare. It's almost impossible for me as an operator to see what's going on inside the vehicle, um, uh, especially during the day. Uh, it complicates the act of, of operation of driving the physical vehicle because reflections happen in weird ways because you've got an, an, an extra panel of glass uh, and often you're just you're shocked wait is that a person running in front of the bus no it's it's a reflection of a reflection um i wish that Great follow-up question there thomas um safety versus meaningful connections are they mutually exclusive it's a challenge. I don't think there is an easy answer there. I would not want to abolish uh, uh, driver barriers simply because I enjoy talking to people. Um, if there's a single mom bus driver who's forced to work at night because she has low seniority and she wants a barrier there, I want it to be there for her so she feels safe. Um, I have liked it there when it when uh, in dangerous situations when I have it makes me feel safe. However. Um, it is also an annoyance. Uh, it gets in the way when you're trying to assist passengers uh, with wheelchairs, when you need to hop out and help somebody with their bicycle. Um, when someone's asking you questions and you wanna give them good customer service and you discover they can't hear anything you're saying. Um, situations like that make me feel like ideally a barrier that had that was in some way optional or retractable maybe, you can slide it out of the way, something like that would be excellent because it would cater to all of these very valid needs. Um, Metro tested out a, a prototype barrier that had that feature, but they decided not to go with it because it had some other problems. One of which was it, the, the bottom part of it was so large, it impeded certain types of wheelchairs from entering the coach. There's so many things um, to, uh, think, to, uh, uh, to think about. I'm really excited that uh, CT does not have shields or barriers, whatever we want to call them. 
I'd like to ask if anyone wants to speak up about that. I'm a little curious. Is there a plan to install them? Do you guys plan to not keep them? People have started telling me, Nathan, you love talking to people. You should go work for CT. They pay more now and they don't have barriers. What are you doing still working at Metro? So I'd love to, if, if anyone wants to share about that, I'm all ears. Um, I know on, on Zoom, sometimes we're hesitant to speak first because we're worried we're gonna interrupt someone else. That's okay, we're adults, we'll, we'll get through it. Um, I'm not sure if there is someone from CT on us here okay. today that could speak to this. Uh, I think we probably do have some CT uh, writers. So mm. I don't know if uh, I see a couple at least. So if one of them wants to speak to the experience, feel free to come off mute. I don't see anybody coming off. Sorry. If you have thoughts later, please, please interject. Um, Cause I'd like to hear about that. Uh, uh, Thomas mentions the uh, new, new low floor buses create a bigger separation between the driver and customer and, and, and there's no more chat seat. Yes, it's a bummer. I also noticed on the Swift vehicles that, that CT uses that the rear facing wheelchair mounts further separate the operator from the customer. Um, not my favorite. Uh, on our rapid ride coaches down here, we have all door boarding. Anyone can get on any door. And I realize how quantifiably that seems like a terrific idea because it expedites service. However, I don't feel as safe when I'm riding those routes. And the reason is because anyone can get on. When someone, when, when I'm doing a route that has front door boarding and people have to walk by me and be greeted by me, they, it diffuses them, it helps them. I'm able to sort of read the room because I know who's inside. I've gotten to see every individual who's getting on. That's, that's helpful for me from a safety perspective. And I can sort of defuse people even before any security situations start by saying, hey, how are you? Um, and uh, that's a way in which customer service is about more than just uh, uh, having friendly conversations and saying hello. It, it has a real safety element. And I do wish there was more opportunities for the driver to interact with customers, passengers for that reason. Um, building on that, uh, I see Atia's question here. Um, would, would you say being friendly and giving respect to those who ride the nighttime line make people feel more human? Um, yes, I would absolutely say yes. And it's what allows me to thrive out there. I would not thrive uh, if I was being a huge jerk to the passengers because whatever energy I give out is what I get back in my face times 10. And when I speak with some of my colleagues who are having a really rough time out there, they're picking up the same passengers I'm picking up. I don't wanna take credit for the fact that everything, that things often go well on my bus, but I think I participate in co-creating something with the passengers where uh, people feel respected. And that usually works out um, to everyone's advantage. Veronica Jarvis says that buses are awesome. I agree. Great observation, thank you for that. Um, and uh, thank you so much. Uh, let's see. Uh, Sherman has been around way back because you remember the 31 on Beacon, which is that's going way back, and the 42 on Martin Luther King. Thank you for having some longtime uh, uh, riders here. Um, Sid says, has the drug issue affected you in any way? What are your thoughts on what happens in your bus, even though it does not happen regularly? Terrific question. When I was driving the E-Line, which is up and down Aurora Avenue, um, that's the bus that has the most security incidents and the most drug use. Uh, and that happened often on that, on, on that route when I was driving it because um, you can't get away from it. Uh, the, it has affected uh, transit significantly. It's a problem that's outside of the purview of a transit organization to solve, though. Um, 
And it's something that we just have to, that I as an operator just have to kind of do my best and put up with. The, the, the top administration at Metro for much of the COVID, um, how can I say this diplomatically, for much of the COVID period uh, did not give us any guidance nor even acknowledge um, that there was a problem with fentanyl on coaches and that as operators and passengers, we were being forced to inhale those fumes. Um, now there's been some high level changes at the top of Metro and we've got a much better team there. I'm excited about that uh, and look forward to something happening. Um, the drug issue has affected things. I used to invite friends or, you know, invite my girlfriend, come ride the bus, you know, we'll chat it up because she and I work opposite hours. I don't get to see her very often. I no longer invite people I know to come ride my bus for fun. Uh, it's not safe anymore. Um, it's, I, I get concerned about uh, people having exposure to those, to these uh, drugs, which are so potent and uh, kill people so easily. I don't, I don't have the answer there. Um, I feel lucky in that because I've worked on building relationships with a lot of the folks who are involved in drugs in Seattle, um, by talking to them on the bus, I mean, uh, it diminishes a lot of the incidents that might otherwise be happening on my bus. They, they, it's been really rewarding to talk to these street kids and to have them tell me, wow, you're the first person who said hi to me all day. You're the only bus driver who um, respects us. And they, they, they feel good about that. And it makes, it just makes my night. Um, I like to imagine, it seems more probable that things in society are cyclic rather than a permanent downturn where everything turns awful and stays awful. I think, um, that there's 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 going to be change there, and I th I think a couple of key uh, legislative changes might affect the reality of what's going on in the street in a really healthy way. We'll see if those happen. Um, Amy Biggs asks, how would you distinguish between what most companies refer to as verbal de-escalation and true customer service? It depends on how we define true customer service. Um, in looking at that, I find myself thinking that that has to do with genuinely looking out for the needs of the passengers. Um, verbal de-escalation seems more sort of agenda-based. You're just trying to prevent a, a fight from happening, for example. A true customer service would mean taking pride in your work, knowing the best system very well, and answering people's questions when they ask, how do I get from here to here? Um, I think both of those have value. Um, Forrest, thank you for thinking the driver choice barrier is interesting. I hope King County administration feels exactly as you do, because that would be really awesome. Um, uh, Thomas, with um, the uh, growing drug concern use on buses, which we sort of went over, uh, no, that concern is not overstated. Such a big issue. Um, and it's better than it was a year ago. But uh, there has not been much meaningful improvement. The people most qualified to say if things are improving or not um, in downtown Seattle are those who spend the most time on Third Avenue. That means operators, that means uh, people who are using drugs or otherwise uh, li uh, living on the street, uh, first responders, police officers. Those individuals encompass every range of the political spectrum, but they would all agree I think that the situation on Third Avenue downtown is a disaster and that it could stand to, uh, to be improved. Um, and uh, Forrest asks, do, do, do people know of transit orgs that have removed barriers or, or are they all here to stay? I'm surprised that CT doesn't have barriers. Um, there, a position has just been created within King County Metro uh, to spend the next year basically gathering research and deciding what's going to happen with our barriers at, at Seattle Metro. Will they stay? Will they be replaced with new ones? Or will they be removed? 
I'm just as curious as anyone else to see what the outcome of that is. Um, how do I feel about child safety now and what can be done feasibly to prove that and get the word out? Uh, Sherman, I would love to hear you elaborate on that question so I make sure I understand exactly what you're asking. I can do that. Like, Thank you. Um, yeah, I just was just kind of reflecting back to my story of how we used to, as kids, ride the bus out on the weekends and go downtown and hang out and do all our stuff. Um, you know, now it seems like uh, the concern about drugs on board or any anything else <clears throat> is a is a major concern to you know, keep kids from wanting to ride the bus. Um, I know some of them have to for school, I guess, I'm not 100% sure on how that works. But, mm -hmm. you know, just to get that the normal kid out there on the weekend, you know, to go wherever they want to go by bus and fee and parents feel safe about it. I'm just kind of wondering, I don't think that I don't think that that's prevalent. I don't think I think there's a there's a a a per perception of you know dangerous to ride the bus if if you're in that age group well you know tweeners i'm not talking about high school kids i'm talking about you know the yeah. age group that i was talking about which is i mean we rode the bus when we were 12 years old Same. <clears throat> every other weekend downtown you know from beacon yeah. hill and yeah hung out downtown and goofed around and you know go shopping at toy stores and right <laughs> whatever but uh right. you know kind of the same thing and i don't know if it's even having kids going downtown seattle for example now is a great idea but yeah you know exactly. at least the bus ride they can feel safe and how do you get the word out and how do you what do we do what can we done what can be done safe for safety and get that perspective cleared up great question i think the uh uh issue extends beyond transit as you say that that downtown seattle um related areas beyond the bus um are environments that are different than they were uh 20 30 years ago and i had three girls last night get on my bus at 10 30 at night going out to rainier valley and it was very obvious that they did not live in that area that they were not comfortable with using transit they were brand new um at this whole thing and i was wondering to myself gosh where are these kids going and and uh is this ride going to be safe for them it turned out to be fine everything was fine on that one particular moment um but yeah my parents would let me ride all over the town when i was 10 years old and i developed this love for the city and this comfort with the city at that time um i would say yes absolutely it's different now and and however, I want to add that there are many facets to the reality of what's going on these days and fear as it pertains to safety sometimes makes us forget about the, the many moving parts that need to be taken into consideration when we're talking about the, 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 the state of the streets. Um, I would not want to advocate for constant uh, child supervision because I feel like kids need to push beyond their, their comfort zones in order to grow. Uh, but at the same time, that's, that's, that's me speaking abstractly. In reality, there are, there are things where, yeah, I would not feel safe um, sending my children if I had them up Third Avenue because there is a heck of a lot of temptation there. Um, and there's also uh, folks that don't have um, uh, the best interests of others in their mind. Survival is necessarily a self-absorbed state of mind. And um, because people are in such an urgent state of living often now where survival is at the forefront, even those of us who are, who are doing okay with jobs and housing, we're, we're, we're still sort of living in this elevated nervous system uh, environment where we're concerned and stressed. And uh, that makes us think about ourselves more than about others. And it's not the best way for society to move forward. So I don't really have an answer there. It's a great point you brought up though. 
Um, You've had a great discussion in the chat and you're answering the questions. It's fantastic. I would love to have that final reading and then- Yes, we'll you're up. right. Yeah. Um, thank you for all these questions, you guys. Um, I'd love to continue uh, 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 chatting about this. Um, the last one I'll quickly answer, do, do I carry Narcan? Yes, have I ever had to use it? No. So it's one of those things. Um, uh, just as a, as a short answer by way of example to what Sherman was talking about. Here's the story, yes. This is called Chosen. Third in Prefontaine Place, northbound. Nobody's at first idea of a safe place to wait for a bus at night. You know the terrain, the way the little things all add up. Uneven sidewalks, an out of commission reader board, the magnificently poor lighting, almost as if on some city planners evilly gleeful purpose, the tents and cries from over there, tensions boiling across the street and you clutching whatever you clutch in your pocket, trying to be gracious in your thoughts as figures lurk about, shifting on the dark urban floor, letting you know they're alive. I roll up slowly in my Route 7. I open the doors to a zone with two people, neither of whom wants my bus, a young white woman, early 20s, in a demure white puffy jacket and nondescript ponytail and jeans. She looks at me through the open bus doors. The other person is called Chosen. That's his name, Chosen. Chosen is a black American man, two generations too old to be sagging his pants, but he does it anyway. Every tatter of clothing in, on his body sags and the phrase dressed in rags is here finally not an exaggeration. If you depicted him in a painting as he is, exposed skin and frayed dead fabric, viewers would accuse you of caricature, saying no man over 40 really stumbles about in this bad of shape with a face like that because his face is magical. The unkempt beard cannot conceal the beauty of his features. Look now at those high cheekbones, the perfect cheeks below them, hollow, like I wished mine were when I was little. His symmetrical eyebrows and sockets and the big emotive eyes within them, expressive eyes, thin skin and gaunt bones with a perfectly proportioned and evocative face. He should be in the movies. You want this guy to play a black Jesus. I think he'd be perfect. He may have a drinking problem, sure, but so did Richard Burton. I will always have a soft spot for Chosen because I once saw a group of girls pepper spray him on my bus for no other reason than that they thought it was funny. You know you want to, they laughed at each other with the same voice you would use for ordering fast food or trying on jeans. They violated him because he was helpless and homeless and it amused them to destroy something beautiful like a child stepping on a butterfly. It was the second ugliest thing I've ever seen. The stinging tears streamed down those beautiful cheeks of his, the Jesus cheeks. And I sat with him as he sat blinded after everyone else had run off and tried to guide him toward the doors. Tonight, Chosen is in far better circumstances. The same tattered garb as per his usual, but no apathetic gangster gaggle of girls to worry about. Between the two of us, hopefully I'm the only one who even remembers the incident. He is slinking about on the sidewalk, mildly disoriented as per character, closer to me than the young woman in the white jacket. I recognize him and call out a nonchalant hello. Just another acquaintance at the office. Oh, hey, Chosen. Hey, how you feeling? Oh, pretty good. Right on, man, have a good one. All right, he said genially, slinking onward, receding into the night shadows. The high point of my entire night was the woman's smile. She had watched the interaction and the two of us locked eyes now. I grinned in return, cheekily. Her smile was a smile of relief where you don't realize you're letting down your tensed shoulders. Everything's fine. Sometimes everything's just fine. She almost laughed, the inherent silliness of our banal pleasantries and, and good natured tones, juxtaposed with Chosen's terrible appearance and the pleasure of her discovering what this bus stop can be. That guy was not a threat. He was just some guy with a name and a friendly bus driver who knew him and who was clearly enjoying being out here at this hour on this block. We both smiled wide, teeth gleaming. And I think we kept smiling our separate ways for a while after. Thank you for listening to that. I realize now that there's quite a bit of overlap between that story and the first one I read, um, which is not intentional, but um, hopefully represents in advance into how the world has changed a little bit, but these types of situations still happen. Uh, in a good way. Um, 
Yes, uh, Brock, I know you might want to take it away. Uh, and I guess I should let you do that. But thank you so much, you guys, for listening yeah. and for taking time out of your day and for asking these great questions. Nathan, that was absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much for your time and for what you do. Um, I'm feeling inspired, and I hope each of our audience members, and I expect they do, uh, take away uh, today's talk, uh, takes it, take it back with you to, uh, to your drivers and operators, to your colleagues, and shares uh, the inspiration you have. Um, if our audience members would like to get more involved with SnowTrack, you can sign up for our newsletter and find out our latest events on our website at gosnowtrack.org slash events. June, of course, is Ride Transit Month. Many of the Ride Transit Month activities have concluded. However, you can still earn a free Ride Transit Month t-shirt from Community Transit by attending one of their community events that they're at, committing to riding to transit and posting a selfie about it, as I did this past week. I uh, got a nice t-shirt out of that. And you can also attend the Mariners game on June 30th for Ride Transit Month at the ballpark. TCC has secured a group rate of just $20 per ticket. So go to their website uh, to get all those details. Uh, thank you again for joining us today. We hope to see you all again soon. Until then, uh, ride happy. Thank you so much, all of you. Um, please stay in touch. I'm, I'm, I'm easily reachable on my website. Uh, I'll have a second book coming out, hopefully within the next year. Um, and thank you again, Brock, and uh, for all of you guys for being interested in transit and uh, working on it. Thank you.